So that was an invocation of this protocol. There are so many directions that one could go to talk about this. The purpose today is, is to get a feeling of it, to possibly learn why it would be used, and a little bit maybe about how one would train. So that, that was a bit of an invocation. Now what I'd like to do is to have a conversation with you all, questions and answers, things in you that feel necessary. This could be clinically as practitioners. It could be personally coming more from the place of being a patient in yourself or trying to understand the tradition as a whole. I, I think any direction we go would be useful to some people. Um, so I'm wondering what the first question is. I'm wondering clinically in terms of diagnosis, what JR taught you in terms of how to diagnose possession and when the Song of the Seven Dragons is needed as well as if that's changed for you over time, how you diagnose currently, um, what you see clinically. Nothing has changed in how I diagnose from how JR taught me. I was not able to, to execute what he taught me for a very long time. JR taught this protocol, at least in my generation, very simply. The major ways you diagnose possession, the direct way possession can be diagnosed is through the eye. It has to do with the way the spirit, are the spirits in residence, first and foremost. If they are not in residence, um, can you enter the person? Can you interact, even in the emptiness? If you run into something, there's a possession. If something is unmoving, I can remember him talking about shark eyes, which really meant very little to me as a beginning acupuncturist. I believed him, but I wasn't able to see yet. He had us do exercises learning how to see a ballpoint pen. how to see the animate spirit in the pen. So if I can't do that, I certainly can't do it with a human eye. So many years of practice. The only way to diagnose a possession is through the eyes. I agree. Realistically, other ways that possessions are diagnosed is through clinical experience is that you, you, nothing is changing in treatment. You're quite certain that your diagnosis constitutionally is accurate, that there are no secondary obstructions, and treatment is not happening. Or treatment progresses and then stops. It is possible to have a, a possession that's not a full possession, Jen. So he taught this. Was I able to execute what he taught? No. But there is a way that possession can be at a certain level of someone. But he kept it very simple. Um, the spirits are in residence and are moving or they are not. There are ways reflectively, I would say this reflectively, that you can go to the pulses and feel certain things on the pulses. I had training with the pulses and possession, which there are some possessions that you can feel on the pulses by a quality that is on all 12 pulses. It is not unique to any one of the officials, which is, it's, it's a quality that muffles all of them. So it's a little bit like having um, raspberry jam on all of the pulses, or a thin layer of peanut butter, or a little bit of saran wrap, or tin foil, something when you, that, that makes all the pulses have a, a, the same quality. Underneath that, depending on the level of the possession, you might feel wiry, you might feel 
slippery. You might feel a deficient pulse or an excess pulse. It's something that is the same across the board that makes it nearly impossible to feel the vitality of the pulses. Saying that, however, that should be a secondary reflective way of saying, yes, in fact, this is a possession. You will be pointed toward possession through someone's um, intake, through their history. You know, if someone has been to every single mode of therapy and they have been to people you know are extremely competent, homeopaths, chiropractors, psychologists, medical doctors, athletic trainers, you know, people who are very, very gifted at what they're doing and nothing has happened. That would be a reason to look for a possession. When a possession is in place, pharmaceuticals don't work well. Massage doesn't last. Um, nothing fully impacts the person. So that was another thing he taught us. You know, one of the tremendous gifts of JR to me, for me is that he transmitted the capacity for a human being to be an instrument of the spirit. And in that transmission, one understood the source of life. In that, that transition, transmission, one understood the potential power of this medicine to cure. So that came with all that he taught. Specifically speaking about possession, I remember him saying this is the most difficult treatment of all. And what he said was, because the point location must be perfect. The way the needle is inserted, the way the tonification, the, excuse me, the sedation, the dispersion of the needle is done. If one of the points is a hair's off, none of them work. So he spoke of this really as a combination, and that the power of the dragons, this power of the fire within the earth, would then be summoned. So it, 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 the severity of the treatment was, was really never spoken of directly in my experience, but the severity of the need for the craft of the physician was. So it could take a whole day to do this treatment with someone because he, he passed on ways of working with the needles to know whether you actually got the point location or not. So you would have to do it again and again and again. And, um, with time, I think there was a way that he trusted the authenticity of his students in the way that he taught it. That in time, people would come to the place where they could see if the spirits were restored to residence in the complexion. Because of that's, of course, how you know the possession's gone. You don't know the possession's gone because green smoke rises and goes out the window. It's ridiculous. It's that the human is restored. He kept it very simple, and I understand why. He translated a, a tradition that goes back to the very beginning of time into the modern Western psyche, and he brought something necessary to be able to reach to the spirit of individuals in this time, but to to grapple with what happens in the mind of the of the of the, the physician in training. We didn't, we didn't do that in our time. There weren't a lot of questions and answers. It was do it this way, and this will happen. And um, I was a very slow learner. You know, even at the beginning, I, it was. It's amazing to me to listen to students coming out of school today, speaking about being able to feel the chi and feel the point move and feel this. I couldn't. I did everything I did at the beginning was what he told me to do. 
I didn't have those senses opened at the beginning. I, I didn't know from inside of myself whether a point had opened or not. Um, I think there are some young people coming out of school who have tremendous capacity that I didn't have at the beginning. Um, but I also think it might be being taught in such a way that people are encouraged to think they have a capacity that actually takes 15 to 20 years to build. I think both things are probably true. This, this particular protocol is the great equalizer. <laughs> you can think that you know what it feels like to be an instrument of the spirits, but if you aren't, this protocol will not open. So the person might get a little relaxed, but you are not going to see a different person walk out of the room. If in fact there is a possession, and if in fact you are treating the possession, and it clears, a different person will leave the room. And I would say from my training, the practitioner is also a different person. The transformation is not just in the patient, it is in the practitioner. So if you are doing three of these a week, and your, your life is not changing, you are not really doing it. And I know that's a bold and possibly arrogant statement, but it really comes from my experience of, of what it is to become um, a needle, what it is to be trusted to work at this level of life. We are not talking about taking a quilt off of a bed and shaking it out the window. That is not what this treatment is. We are talking about the molecular, fundamental building blocks of someone's life, the relationship of the essences and the spirits. It's far smaller than a microscope could ever see, and far vaster than a telescope could ever see at the same time. The, that is what a needle, that is the equation that the needle connects smaller than small and larger than large. So does that answer your question? Yes. Point location is was critical. It's how you begin to be a student of this protocol. And inherent in how he taught it is if someone gives themselves to the beginning for 20 years, then you are teachable and you can be led by the point itself. That's why he gave us command points and seasonal points to work with, because if you can become an instrument of the power of spring becoming summer. Don't you think after 20 years that you might be able to be led into the deep mysteries of the Tao? First you learn respect. First you learn obedience to the laws. The movement of spring to summer builds a meadow. So you know, this, tr this protocol was taught as something that is necessary if that cycling of the laws of nature isn't happening. So if you can't see it, then you discover it because the seasons aren't changing in the person. Now, unfortunately, in our time, we have so much mental stuff about what's what an, what an authentic life should look like, that it's quite confusing. You really do need your senses because people will talk as if the seasons are changing. But are they? It's your job to know that. It's like if I go to a, an internist and I'm having a nervous breakdown, but I go to the internist and tell him I'm having a stomach ache, and I keep telling him a stomach ache, it would be very good if the internist knew that I was actually crackers and could build a bridge to someone who could help me. 
That would be very good, and it actually happens more often than we think. Doctors have a very bad rep these days. There are many, many physicians who are awake in that way. You've come because your foot hurts, but actually you're having a complete mental breakdown. How does that happen? We as acupuncturists should be able to do that. I would like our standards of excellence to be going up, not down. But that's a personal opinion. This is an extraordinarily powerful system of medicine. JR said it's the most powerful medicine on the planet. And I would have to say, watching dead people come alive, I would agree with him. But how it's done and the disciplines and the reverence to the disciplines. You are in the footsteps of great beings. So that was inherent in how he taught. He didn't speak of it that way, but you felt it. You felt that he had been given something alive. And with every breath of his life, he was transmitting it. So that's what I would say about, about that. We didn't have deep conversations about possession. Um, I don't enjoy having deep conversations about possession either, except in the context of really a, a deep yearning to serve. As an idea, I think it ends up in the, in the wrong place most of the time. I was interested to hear more about the void of the heart. Can you give me just a little bit? I know that you're interested in that as a human being, and mm -hmm. that the only real life is the cultivation of the heart. But can you give me a little bit of context for the question so I know where to go? To it seems so fundamental in the Chinese approach to well-being, and it seems like a much bigger, con a, a different concept than what we have in our world today. Okay, so let's just start simply anatomy, the energetic anatomy of the heart. The heart is the center of life. It is, it is the arena of life. The Chinese, in order to work with the, this, the enormity of what the heart is. There are actually four organs which together operate as what we in the West call the heart. The void of the heart is what the Chinese call the heart. The official of the heart, the Lord and Sovereign of the body, mind, spirit. The authority of life, the, the absolute authority of life is in the heart, the Shen, the birds. In the West, we would say, where the will of God resides. There are three other officials which or organs, three other officials which enact the heart in the world. So the void of the heart, from a Chinese point of view, you have to speak of the Lord and Sovereign, the heart. It governs life. It governs life through the presence of the spirits in the emptiness of the heart. So life is governed through inspiration, not muscle. The officials, the other 11 officials, are inspired to their task through their relationship to the void, to the emptiness of the heart. So the, the heart is to be empty. Spiritual practice in all traditions empties the heart, whether it is the rosary, whether it is meditation, Buddhist meditation practice, whether it is gauntlets, vision quests. What is a vision quest? Your heart is emptied. 
of your terrors of being alone, of your longing to be found. All traditions, when reality, what is possible to be real, is through the emptiness of the heart. Revelation comes to the emptiness of the heart. Everything that happens, everything that happens passes through the heart. The heart is not moral. The heart does not work with good and evil. Everything that is passes through the heart. Emphasis on passes through. Things keep moving. What happens, the pathology of the heart, is things accrue to the heart. The difference between I feel sad and I am sad would be in English how you would. It, the, the reason for it to remain empty is so that the divine can be present. The divine is not human. The divine is what created heaven and earth and all of the worlds. It is not a cozy little puppy that you snuggle up to. The heart is capable of holding all of creation in it. It is beyond anything we could imagine. The only thing we are taught to do in every tradition is to keep it empty. So this problem in our time of knowing the way and recognizing what is right and blah, 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 is we're just accruing thought forms to the heart instead of awe, instead of the terror of not knowing, the right kind of terror. So there are two points that, that have the possibility of reaching directly into the void of the heart, and that is the master point of the IDs and heart seven. Now, you can't enter the void of the heart unless your own heart is empty. So JR had this wonderful practice of leaving the treatment room, going into the bathroom, looking in the mirror and saying, what's wrong? <laughs> You know, it, it can be very simple. It doesn't have to be grandiose ritual and imagine a waterfall and wash under it and whatever. I mean, if it works for you, fine. But fundamentally, take one step away from yourself and behold the path. You must step out of yourself, what you think of as yourself. The void of the heart is empty. So that doesn't mean you're thinking. It's actually empty. It is full of life. The intelligence is beyond our understanding. Mountains are moved. It's not a process in the void of the heart. There is no process in the void of the heart. the intelligence of the light. Not my intelligence, not my understanding, which is, which is a certain kind of intelligence, but it's nothing. It's a less than a grain of sand in, in the desert to the intelligence of the birds. So does that answer your question? Right, so the IDs and the EDs work with the void of the heart. The EDs, it's a little bit different because you start with do 20. The, the conductor of the EDs is do 20. Um, People would speak of this in a very different way. I will say how I think of it. Whereas Ren, the master point between Ren 14 and Ren 15 is actually, there is a door. It is a door into the void of the heart. Do 20 is through the heart of the teacher. 100 meetings. It is through 
the relationship to the ancestors would be the traditional Chinese way. Our, the, the well-being of our life is understood by the efficacy of the guardianship of the ancestors. That only happens if our worship is intact. So it's a, it's a reflection of a reflection of a reflection, right? But I, I would say myself, do 20 has to do with my devotion to the one who stands in the door of my training. And through that devotion, do 20 calls. They're very different experiences, in my experience as a practitioner. Um, the IDs and the EDs. Um, they are very different experiences from the perspective of the patient also. What is common is a sense that you can't get where you need to get. <clears throat> you know, you will hear patients say, I, I can I know I can do it, I just can't. Or, you know, you see someone going from therapist to therapist to therapist to therapist. It's like the effort is there. They haven't lost the, the, the feet to walk them to truth, but they can't find it, right? It's an inside job. But unfortunately, it's not an inside job you can do on your own. This is a big mistake in the West. We think inside means I'm supposed to do it myself. Outside, it's fine to rely on the surgeon to take your appendix, but inside, it's not okay to rely on the practitioner of whatever medicine to walk me out of hell. We think we're supposed to be able to do that ourselves. We're embarrassed culturally. We, we are embarrassed to say, I am lost. Please help me. But we aren't embarrassed to say, I have 200 over 110 blood pressure and I need the drug for coronary artery disease. You see, we've, it's, it, this is cultural values, different times. So it's advantageous in certain ways and it's not in other ways. I, I believe to the core of my being that if someone has become an acupuncturist, somewhere in them they are prepared to be trained to walk in the unseen. They would not be interested in chi if they weren't. And it is my great sorrow that much of the training is becoming physical technical because it's yes we can do it I mean that is not a difficult thing but, but that it, it's like I don't know it's like um, pounding a nail in with the most valuable violin on the planet I mean you can do it but why not use a hammer for that and play music on the violin it's just, you know, it, we Americans are quite impatient as a group and to be able to work as a servant of the emptying of the heart, Deb, requires tremendous patience, tremendous devotion. You can't be smarter than your teacher after one year of practice and ever be led into the void of the heart. It doesn't work that way. Thank goodness. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not an acupuncturist, but um, I would imagine that it takes a lot of courage to treat patients who are in possession for whatever reason. But I'm interested in, in layman's terms, and this is the way I interpreted what you said earlier about the practitioner actually having to transform him or herself in this protocol. It, it's kind of like going with the river of the patient's illness and knowing when you're the bank and when you're the river and when you need to get out. And I just wonder how you actually 
you must have to forgive yourself if you make a mistake, or you, you, there must be some discipline around the structure of going in and out again from that kind of treatment. Maybe you could talk about that a little bit. I love that question for many, many reasons. I fundamentally started providing places for people to train because of that question. That to having an experience of being at somewhere in this protocol and realizing that I had no idea how I got there and I had no idea what was going on. For some reason, I think because of my connection to J.R. Worsley, I didn't get afraid. But I know that very little happened because I, I, the context of that being used. Um, I love the sound of the way you talk about the courage because I agree. And I wish there were more conversations in acupuncture school about courage. I had a teacher who said, you have to be arrogant enough to step up to the needle and humble enough for the needle to come alive. There is a courage to be transparent. You need courage to be with someone in a state of absolute terror. It takes tremendous courage to become a human being. And after courage, it takes an unbelievable amount of strength to withstand the conflict in oneself, first and foremost. So it's an excellent question. It's what training as a physician for the whole of your life, from my point of view, Sarah, is all about going in and coming out until such time that that makes no sense to you. But you cannot fast forward. Sometimes, especially in the beginning, there's great mysteries that are given at the beginning. You step up to the plate. You, you know something about oneness. You know it like you know what it tastes like to drink water. You know it. But the training traditionally takes you through the by roads and side roads and underbelly of duality. You do have to consent to learning how to enter and how to leave. This is the humility. This is chop wood, carry water. You know, you didn't hold a needle for years and years in the training. You learned how to carry water without spilling it. You learned how to walk by someone with a heavy load without intruding on their silence. You know, under this question, from my point of view, and I'm not sure if you were consciously thinking about it, is the problem of power. The authority that is given to have a sign that says, I am an acupuncturist, and the authority that is given to say, I will walk with you, and the trust that is then given or not given in response to that authority. I think often acupuncturists are in a place where they're, well, I can just speak of myself, where because JR handed me a living tradition and I did what he said, I had the authority of the tradition. I did not doubt that pericardium nine moved spring to summer because of the way it was given. That is a huge power. But because it was given through him, through the heart, I, I didn't have an issue there. 
But if you go into this protocol, the seven dragons, and you're talking about going directly into the void of the heart of another human being, I hope you're scared. And I don't mean scared not to do it, the right kind of fear. We're talking about the seat of consciousness in another human being. Tremendous question of ethics. So if you're going to go past the very beginning of teaching this, in my opinion, the, the teaching is at least 50% living ethics. Then there's the teaching of the craft and the disciplines and all the rest. But that's where I go with your question is the, the I don't think so much about safety as ethics. You know, the, the, there's a certain way people talk about keeping themselves clear. You know, clearing their energy after they've worked. Some people need to do this. There's some traditions of energetic healing that that's very central to. It never has been something I've thought a lot about, especially when you're working with the heart, because from the place in me that God is alive to the place in you that God is alive, how in the world could that need cleaning? So my experience of the, this particular protocol and possession is if I got into a situation where I was afraid or where it felt like something I couldn't handle, I stopped. And I still in that way. I stop differently now because I know because of my willingness to go as far as this protocol will take me that there are treatments that I can't do today that I will be able to do in a year. But I, there are treatments that you end up in something bigger than you that hopefully that would be what I certainly what I say to anyone I'm teaching. If you get nervous, stop. And we'll do it together. You'll do it next year. You know, you want to be respectful, especially if the treatment is taking you to that place of the relationship of the unseen and the seen. You want to be careful, not only for you, but also for the patient. Does that get there? There's a tremendous tradition that is carried in these ancient odes, these ancient songs, where the awakening of the practitioner, the cultivation of the heart of the practitioner happens in the work with the patients. That's why I always say this is the very best profession anyone could ever have. You don't have to go to work and then go to a spiritual workshop. It's all happening at the same time. The, the, the way one approaches the Tao is through the darkness. So these protocols all work with the dark void of the heart. And that's a very esoteric conversation. Being invited into the deep esoteric tradition of Chinese medicine is uh, the greatest gift of my life. And most of those conversations happen in the course of the work. They don't happen in lecture. We are in a world with way more ideas than we know how to work with. I do 99% of all teaching clinically in the relationship alive. So. Possession is a very real illness. I will say that. It's, it got put in the hands of the priests in the West, and it was understood to be a battle of good and evil. Prior to that, it was not in the hands of the priests. It is very, very deep in our understanding of how we become ill. So part of the early training is lifting um, some of the terrible drama of it so that we actually can start to talk about it. What does it look like? 
how does it what is it what's the reality of the patient um, I was terrified to start using this protocol so terrified I bought a used book in a red cover in a used bookstore it said possession on it I bought it like the second week of acupuncture school I've never read it and I keep it because when I look at it, it, it that book holds an awareness of the beginning for me of my eagerness like it, something about this protocol and its presence in the materia medica handed to me made me recognize something I recognized something because it was there but I was terrified I was absolutely terrified. I didn't actually, Emily, want to know what the seven stages were. It took years to, to realize how many people I thought I had helped, that I, I really hadn't done anything but sweep a little bit of stuff around, move a few little bits of furniture around. Probably the first generation of students of JR's had more experience with the protocol than I did initially, when it was wilder and coming just coming from China. These protocols work with all 360 points. They are very, very, very powerful magic. That's why he said you have to get all seven exactly. Because what happens is something starts moving that works with all whatever points are necessary in that universe whose name might be Sarah. It starts turning. Terrible brainwashing. The collective level, these songs penetrate, move through, begin to dissolve. It's really quite remarkable. Extremely difficult, this protocol can become if, in fact, you choose to learn how to participate more directly. Very demanding. Of your heart. The job of the teacher really is over time to help forge the central axis in, in the student so that you can stand through it, not run away or collapse. You young ones, if you want to do this, some part of you will have to get very old. Certain things, age, naturally aging, loosens our attachments to certain things. You watch people die, you watch your ideas fail. You come to terms with life. But if you're young and you want to do this, that will be accelerated. You will be separated from some of the compulsions of your age peers. Because you can't, you can't be an instrument of something that bound together from a place in yourself that is bound. Because you would just reenact the same terrors. Right? This song is not a battle. This is a protocol that works with the deepest intelligence of earth in response to heaven. A fern knows where it belongs. Apple trees do not grow at 16,000 feet. Leopards do not 
crawl into bed with girls and snuggle. Right? There's a deep intelligence to every life form and it knows what it is and it knows where it belongs. And those that trained in the mysteries were let into some of that. The plants themselves taught people the medicine they could deliver. The acupuncture points do the same. When you have trained, this is not ideas. This is not reading the point name and going on an active imagination dream trip. The point itself teaches you. It instructs your hand like a master woodworker would take your hand and move it. And then, if your reflective process is intact, reflectively, you understand something. It's tremendously alive, and I have no idea why it is surviving our modern time, but it is in small little ways, in individual practitioners. The tradition goes all the way back. It's, you know, it's at risk, I think. The modern mind is so aggressive. We want so much now.